Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. David and Goliath, Underdogs, Misfits, and the Art of Battling Giants, Malcolm Gladwell talks about how children that lose a parent when they're young end up disproportionately being more successful in life than those who don't. He calls them imminent orphans. And it kind of goes counterintuitive because we would tend to think, hey, listen, if you were raised in a stable home, you know, your parents were alive. You didn't have too much difficulty. You were surrounded with love and encouragement that that would give you a leg up. But the studies just didn't, didn't show that. And what he said is, is that when you lose a parent or you go through other kinds of difficulties, but he specifically was talking about losing a parent when you were young. He said new things kicked in. You had to on your own create more grit and drive and challenge yourself and take more responsibility and those also were indicators of being successful in life. A couple of the examples he cites is 67 percent of British prime ministers from the start of the 19th century all the way to the beginning of World War II ended up they were prime ministers but they had 67 um, percent had a one of their parents die when they were young. 12 U.S. presidents lost their fathers when they were young, which is almost a third. So it's, it's, it's kind of like an amazing thing. Wow, you'd think, you know, that uh, having an easier, better life would be better. But actually, he says that if, it, if you had to choose, when you start out between pain and love, pain is a better indicator of success. Now, the person we're looking at today is a guy named Joseph. We're in a series called Families Are Messy, and we're looking at Genesis. We're going through the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and their wives, Sarah, uh, Rachel, uh, Rebecca, and Leah. And we're noticing that their families are pretty messy. They've got a lot of problems going on, and we're walking, and we're watching in Scripture how God interacts with them, and then we're really saying, you know what, our, our family's got some mess too. How does God interact with us? And so Joseph, here he's this, he's, he's an eminent orphan. He, when he was only seven years old, his mother died of, uh, from childbirth. And then when he was 17, he was, he was uh, kidnapped by his brothers and sold into slavery. But he ends up becoming prime minister of, of the most powerful country on earth at the time. So here he, he fits right in with one of those same statistics. Somebody who had it tough, lost a parent, really lost two in a sense, and then, and then ends up being highly successful. Have you ever asked yourself, you know, when you're in a tough spot, and maybe you come from a messy family, and you're going, why did this happen? Why was I neglected? Why was I raised in a home where there was abuse, or there was alcoholism, or some kind of an addiction, or I was molested, or I, uh, a, a parent died, or there was schizophrenia, or there was a suicide, or there was so much uh, upheaval and job loss and financial problems, and you just, and why, uh, why me, God? Have you ever asked that question? Well, certainly Joseph would have asked that question. I mean, we asked the question, Joseph would have asked the question, uh, because that wasn't the only scenario going on in his life. As I said, not only did he ha lose his mother when he was young, he was betrayed by his brothers. They kidnapped him. They were going to kill him. They hated him because of uh, he was his, their father's uh, favorite. 
There was a, he had 11 other brothers, and his father loved him the most, showed more favoritism. They got so jealous, that's why they, that's why they kidnapped him, sold him into slavery for 20 pieces of silver, silver to some Ishmaelites. They took him down to Egypt, and he was sold to a guy named Potiphar. He ends up serving him for 10 years, and then towards the end of that, even though he's faithful, even though he tries real hard, he gets accused, falsely accused of attempted rape. And because of that, he's thrown into prison. And then he languishes in prison. He ends up, he works real hard to be a good prisoner. He ends up connecting with, uh, befriending a cupbearer for the Pharaoh who happens to be in there. Interprets a dream, gives him good news. The guy goes, I'll remember you when I get out. He gets out, he forgets Joseph. Joseph languishes for another two years in prison. But nowhere are we told that God revealed to him, hey, don't worry, Joseph, all of this is going to work out. It's going to be fine in the end. He doesn't know that. It's kind of like us when we're in the middle of our family mess, when we're in a difficulty. We're, we don't know how it's going to work out. And Joseph is just sitting there in prison wondering what is going on. What is going on when you're in a difficult spot when you have family mess and you look around and there's Alzheimer's and there's, there's uh, uh, physical disabilities and, and, and all kinds of problems that you might have. You might be in a, ter a marriage that's very unfulfilling, some kind of uh, tragedy that's going on. And you go, why, why me? What's, go what's going on here? And you know, the answer is we often don't know. We don't know. The Bible's not always clear, and, and God's not always clear on why did this happen to me. So where does that leave us? Well, the problem is when, there's an, I, I, when we don't know, we sometimes try to fill in the blank, and there's a temptation to fill in the blank with false information. And here's the most common. The most common false way to answer that is this. Maybe God is just judging me. Maybe he's judging me for something I've done. That's on your outline. That's the first blank. Uh, he's judging me because of past stuff I did. Now, we're not talking about natural consequences. We know natural consequences that if you uh, are unfaithful in your relationship to your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your spouse, you might lose that relationship, right? We know that if you smoke, you might end up with emphysema. If you... Uh, drop out of school, you might have limited job opportunities. Those are natural consequences. We get that. But we're not about all of the pain and the problems and the tribulations and the troubles of life. We don't get it. We don't understand it. We don't see a connection and we tend to then blame God. We say, God, you must be judging me. And the Bible's very clear that we should not go down that pathway. We shouldn't be like the cleric, the, the Muslim cleric who when the, in 2004, the tsunami that killed all of those people on the beaches in Indonesia and in Asia, they said, well, that's God, that's Allah judging the people for the sex trade that's going on there. I mean, the people that were on the beach the families with young kids, they were the least likely to actually be participating in the sex, sex trade. Or like the Christians who would stand up uh, on TV and say, uh, you know, during Hurricane Katrina, they said that is the judgment on that city in New Orleans because of the sinfulness of that city. And we, the Bible says, be careful. We don't want to go down that road. Don't attribute God's judgment on people on situations. Jesus specifically talks, I mean, a number of times, but here's a couple that I put out there for, for us to read this morning. John 9, it says, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. Now, this is Jesus, sees this man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So Jesus says, no, actually God's at work in this. There's something going on. You might not understand it, but God is behind the scenes. And then Jesus' statement in Luke 13, he says, now there was some present at the time, at that time, who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. 
all those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. These were things that had happened during their day. And they were going, wow, maybe this is God. And you go, no, 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 this is not the case. And we can think of uh, a people that uh, have that uh, have died young. Martin Luther King Jr. was killed when he was 39. And there's... Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he was hanged by the Nazis when he was 39. And these were great men. Jim Elliott, martyred missionary of the Alka Indians when he was 39. Oswald Chamber, a great devotional writer, he died when he was 43. Peter Marshall, who died when he was 47. All these people, the world wasn't worthy of them, and yet we needed their leadership and their, 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 uh, their modeling, their influence, and they died. Their, their lives are cut short. And you can stand back and go, what's, what's that about? You know, why did, this, why did this happen? We don't always know, as I said. But as believers, we can, we can hold some, th- some three truths in place, it's kind of suspended. They don't always feel like they fit together. But three truths. Number one is, is that there's true utterness of evil. The evilness of evil. And Joseph, when he's talking about what happened to him, he, ta- he, he brings all three of these in. Notice what he says here, first of all, in Genesis 50, 20. He says, you intended to harm me. Now, that word harm in Hebrew is the same word for evil. He said, you meant to cause me evil, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So, in our Christian testimony, sometimes we will diminish evil. We, like, minimize it. Well, you know, I was molested as a child, but I, I guess it wasn't that bad because I ended up becoming a Christian because of it. Well, is that the only way you can become a Christian, is to be molested as a child? No. And so we don't want to minimize it. That's evil. That was wrong. That's, 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 just, that's, just, that's, that's evil. It's evilness of evil. Or somebody might say, oh, my four-year-old child died, but I, you know, it's not that bad because, you know, at the funeral, somebody came to Christ. No, that's never good that a four-year-old child dies. That's always bad. And so we don't minimize evil. We recognize it, but at the same time, we recognize the goodness of God, the utter goodness of God. God is good through and through. Now, it's interesting. This is, he has both of these in the same sentence there when he's talking about this. He says, you, in, you intended, me, uh, intended to harm me there in verse 20, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So behind a tragedy, we recognize that God is good, even though it may not, we don't see it at the time. We don't get it. We're perplexed. We're confused. We don't see the goodness, but we know when all is said and done, that God is good. God is good. And that God is not the one who causes evil. When evil happens, it's not at the hand of God. It's God because God is good. Psalm 34, 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are those who take refuge in Him. So I might not understand it, but I believe, the Christian says, that God is good. And then number three, that God is sovereign. The sovereignty of God. Three times in this verse, in Genesis 45, there in verses 5 through 8, Joseph is reaccounting about the, how he was poorly treated, and he's maligned, he was betrayed, kidnapped, sold into slavery. And, but instead of that, he says three times, God sent me to Egypt. He's not denying the fact that those other things had happened. He's just saying this is, he's, he's reflecting on the sovereignty of God. God was, there's a, in the backdrop, God was, was at work. He was using this stuff. And now do not be distressed, he says to his brothers, and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. So regardless of bad intentions, regardless of being neglected as a child, regardless of somebody hurting you intentionally or unintentionally, or even natural 
consequent, I mean, uh, natural disasters. We still know that God is in charge. Now, certainly there's God's directive will and there's God's permissive will. God's directive will is, is I want this done and he makes it happen. God's permissive will is that he allows things to happen, but it's not his, it's not his perfect will. It's not, and it's like in heaven, heaven, his perfect will happens. On earth, it doesn't because there's evil at play. God does not cause evil. He is never the cause of evil, but he will use evil and the effects of it to cause good because he is so good. He, 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 there's free will, there's evil, but he uses that to still accomplish his purposes. That's why Jesus said when we're praying, he said, make sure and pray, you know, that he says, pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The reason is God's will is not always done on earth. It's done in heaven. There's something great happening in heaven. It's missing here, so we're to be praying. God, I want your will done in my family. I want your will done in my life. I want your will done in my workplace. I want your, and we are praying. We're praying because we know God's will is not always done. Nicholas Walterstorff wrote a book called Lament for a Son. It's a very honest and painful book as he examines his, and processes his grief because he had lost his 25-year-old son in a mountain climbing accident. And one of the things when he's reflecting on the psalm that says, how long, O Lord, how long, about God's slowness, he says this, he says, if lament and protest are indeed legitimate components of the Christian life, then divine sovereignty is not to be understood as everything happening just as God wants it to happen or happening in such a way that God regards what he does, not like as an acceptable trade-off for the good thereby achieved. Divine sovereignty insists in God's winning the battle against all that has gone awry with respect to God's will. God permits whatever is happening to happen. Whatever is happening is often much less than what God wants, but God will win the battle in the end. See, this is God's sovereignty, and we see God's sovereignty in the cross of Christ as well. Jesus came to earth. He lived a perfect life. He was falsely accused horribly tortured, was crucified, and yet he rose from the dead. And when we put our faith in his resurrection and what he did for us, we are beneficiaries. We receive salvation. We receive life here on earth. We receive power for living through the power of the resurrection. But all three of these things are found in that. We have the responsibility, the moral responsibility of humankind and we reflected that with evil. But yet God's goodness was so good that the, the day won out and his sovereign plan still won. Here's, it's summarized here in Acts 2. It says, people of Israel, this is Peter talking. He says, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, signs, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep it hold on him. So here it's all three. He says, there's, surely there was wickedness, but there's also goodness and there's God's sovereign plan that's being unfolded. A verse that I think it represents this really well for us is Romans there on your outline, Romans 8, 28. For we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purposes. So in all things, I think when Paul's writing this, he's saying, yeah, he means all. He means all things God works and weaves that, even the bad things, even the horrible things, even the financial failure, even the marital, even the divorce, even the, the infidelity, even the molestation, even the, the, uh, the addiction, even the, the, uh, the unhappy relationship, even the suicide, even the mental illness, even the diseases, even the good things. He says all those things God for those who are called according to his purposes, he doesn't cause a lot of those things, but he, because he's good and he's sovereign, but he uses them to advance his will in your life. And that's good news. So how does God do that? Three ways. Number one, it's hard things 
increase our dependence on God. Hard things increase our dependence on God. We, when, when difficult things come my way and yours, you respond the way I do. You just feel like you're un- inadequate. All of a sudden, you have this sense of weakness that wasn't there before. When things are going well, you're thinking, hey, I'm doing good, man. I'm awesome. I got it. You know, I'm in control. But when all of a sudden you get that phone call or you get that, that diagnosis or something comes and it's overwhelming and you, all of a sudden you're kind of like rattled to the core and you're going, I can't do this. I can't do this. Somebody's attacking my reputation. I can't do this. We find out we get a law suit against us. I can't do this. And we're, we're, we're aware of our own limitations and our weakness. And for a Christ follower that we draw to God in those moments, we say, you know what? In my weakness, I will find the strength of God. Paul did this. Paul's writing about his own weakness. He actually prays, I really don't even want this weakness. I want this, what he calls a thorn in the flesh to be removed. God doesn't remove it in this case, but instead speaks a word of promise about his power in his life. He says, therefore, there in 2 Corinthians 12, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace, this is God speaking to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made it's made perfect in weakness. Now here, so, so Paul gets that. We're kind of reading after the fact. This had already happened. So as he thinks about it, okay, I'm gonna, this thorn in the flesh is staying. It's a weakness. God's going to use it to perfect his grace in my life, his power in my life. So here's what he concludes. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. Now, I don't know anybody who does that. I certainly don't. I don't go around, let me tell you about all my weaknesses, and I'm boasting about it. No. I mean, I, 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 you're probably like me. I don't want to display those, but he does. Paul says, no, and here's why. Because when I boast about my weaknesses, he says, it's in that place that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, yeah, then I'm strong. When I'm overwhelmed with hardship and I'm, and I'm acutely aware of my limitations and weaknesses, it's in those moments where I can really depend on God. And number two, hardships, when they come, they also increase our longing for God. We long for God's glory. We long for God's second coming when Jesus is going to come again and set things all right like the song we were just singing. There's a day when that happens, but when things are going well for us, when everything's kind of happening well, everything's, our finances are up and to the right, our health is good, our relationships are good, everything seems to be good. We're in that moment of, of prosperity. We tend not to depend on God. We, t- we, de- we tend to not look to God and yearn for God's setting everything right. We don't, we don't groan for that as the Holy Spirit says. In, in Romans it says, Holy Spirit wants to, we groan, come Holy Spirit. Instead, we're just kind of in our little happy place. We don't really care about what's going on in the world. The world could be going to hell. It doesn't really matter. We're doing well. But when bad things happen, when hard things come our way, then all of a sudden, we start to identify with the pain of the world. We identify with the challenges in the world that's not set right. And we might cry out like Habakkuk did. How long, Lord, must I cry out for help? But you do not listen or cry out to you violence, but you do not save. This is a, a prayer of frustration. God, I want things to be different. And we start to cry out. We pray, Lord, I change the situation that we find in our inner cities in America. Or Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are in prison in China and in Iran and in North Korea. Lord, I pray for the, the challenges and the problems of the, of the human trafficking. And we start, to, we start to care about the boundaries outside of ourselves. And that happens when hardship comes. Number three, when hard things come, they increase our assurance of our belonging to God. Rather than prove that you are the rejected by the Lord because difficult things come, instead, it becomes a test 
and you say, I'm going, this, this demonstrates how much I really love the Lord. This demonstrates my faith and how deep my roots, my spiritual roots go. Because it is true when difficult times come, and they will for all of us, universally it's going to happen. It will be a test of our faith. Jesus talks about it in the parable of the sower. He says that the sower comes along, sows seed, and in some situation, and, and when the heat comes, some people, they just leave. He says that the, that, the, that the plant dies, withers, and then he makes the parable. He says that's like people just leaving. In other words, they, they, they try out Christianity, and then difficult times come, and they go, well, I guess I'll pass. I guess it wasn't that important to me. I guess God really isn't that real. And they, they, they make those choices to, to go a different way. Jesus says, though, that some seed grows up healthy, even in those same circumstances. Why? Because it's a proof. Jesus says that those are really the children of God. The people that when hardship comes, it just demonstrates where they're at. In their faith, it demonstrates they really have the Holy Spirit residing in them. Probably the most infamous person known for suffering in the Bible is a guy named Job. Job had all kinds of problems, family messes. I mean, he, there was terrorists that came, killed some of his kids. There was a tornado that killed uh, the, all of his family. His whole, all of his family, it was just him and his wife. He lost his estate. He lost his house. All, he lost his job, everything. And he even lost his health. Now, his wife went through the same thing. She didn't lose her health, but she lost all the other things. Those were her, ki her kids, too. It was her house. She needed that income. And, and, and so they're now together. All of this hardship comes. They don't respond the same way. They don't respond the same way. Notice how jo Job's wife responds. His wife said to him there in Job 2.9, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. What is the point of loving God? If this is how we're going to be treated, no, there's no reason we should be serving and loving and being faithful. That's her response, but Job responds differently. Job says in 2.10, he says, you're talking like a foolish woman. Ex shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And all of this, Job did not sin in what he said. And then here's one of the greatest faith statements we find in the entire Bible. He says in Job 13.15, though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. Now, friend, this is not something we say in our natural self. You can't say this unless the Holy Spirit is residing in you. Where you say, though he takes everything away, even my own life, I will still serve him and love him and be faithful to him. This is something that is supernatural. And this is why it demonstrates that you are one of God's chosen. It means that you're, you have the Holy Spirit in you. You're one of his children. Hardships demonstrate that one time, in John 6, Jesus had said some things, did some things that were offensive to that, to that group of people in that culture. And so a lot of them just left. They said, we're done with Jesus. And they left. There was a few left. And Jesus said, what are you going to do? Are you going to leave? And they thought about it for a little bit. They responded. They said, where else would we go? Where else? You, are, you hold the words of life. Amen. You see, they were tested with hardship. Each one of us, we're always tested, and we can choose one path or we can choose a different path. And so it always, it always comes back to that, that, you know, God's at work in our life, and he uses hardship. He did with Joseph. You know, the great things that happened to Joseph are not that he became prime minister of the most powerful country on earth. And it wasn't that he got to vindicate himself against the vengeance of his brothers and what they did to him. The world might look at that and say, yeah, yeah, he, look at what, look, that's his great success. No, hey, the greatest things that happened to Joseph were that he got to be, his life was used to save many, many lives and that he changed in the process. He became a different person. And so at the end of his life, when his brothers were afraid of him, his father had already died and they're saying, what are you gonna do to us, Joseph? He goes, I'm not going to do anything. In fact, I'm going to bless you guys. I'm going to set you up in Goshen. I'm going to give you a great life. He goes, I'm not going to hold resentment against you. I'm not going to, I'm not embittered against you. He had become a different person. And that is what God wants to do in your life. He changes us. He makes you different. Wouldn't you like to be different? Wouldn't you like to be less selfish, 
less close hearted, close handed, less stingy, less moody. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to be more generous, more kind, more patient? And a better husband, a better wife, better father, better mother, better brother, sister, better friend, a better listener. These are the things that God is at work. And he uses, he doesn't cause evil. There's plenty of that in the world. But he uses the hardships of life to create in us to be more like him. This is his ultimate goal, that we're more like his son. Notice this last verse on your outline. See what? Great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we, shall, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. All of this are, are all who have this hope in him, purify themselves just as he is pure. The, this word purify is, the word, is, is sanctify. It means God is, is, is purifying us or changing us to become the way he wants us to be, to become more like Christ, to become a reflection of his love uh, in this world. And this is what it means to be a Christ follower. This is what it means to go through difficulty and hardship. This is how we're to respond when we have family messes. Let's bow our heads and pray. So we're going to just take a moment to pray. I'm going to invite the worship team to make your way up here as we're, uh, as we're taking a moment and praying. I want to pray for you. If you're here and you have, you're struggling in a family mess or maybe you had one uh, growing up and it's really kind of hampered you, let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray right now that your, your grace would come and fill this place. Come Holy Spirit. Help us to realize you're not a judging God. That's the false things that the world puts in. Maybe we did. But today, Lord, we're going to recognize there is evil out there, but you are good and you are sovereign. We don't always understand why you allowed things to happen, but God, we know that in all things, you work together for good in our lives. And when hardship comes, Lord, I pray that every person here, when hardship comes, that, um, hold on just a moment. Father, I just, I just pray, Lord, your anointing come, Lord. I pray that anybody who's in a pain, difficulty, Lord, that you, um, your grace would be sufficient for them. In their weakness, if in your weakness, Lord, I pray that your grace is sufficient. If you've never asked Christ into your life, just, it's simple, all you do, and just a simple prayer, you just say, God, Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for your resurrection. Make it real for me in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. And we'll see you next week.